Dear students, I welcome you all for the MOOCs Understanding South Asia. Today, I will be delivering an important lecture on colonialism in South Asia, a contestation. The main themes will be covered in this lecture are understanding the concept of colonialism and its various forms, causes of the separate of colonialism, colonial onslaught on South Asia, East India Company, colonial historiography and its contestation. Dear students, let's understand first the concept of colonialism. Generally, it's agreed by the scholars across the disciplines that colonialism is a form of domination, the control by individuals or groups over the territory and behavior of other individuals or groups. Though the emphasis is on the group domination, but not to social relations and processes among set of individuals at family or subclass level. Colonialism is associated with power hierarchy between the rulers and the ruled. So colonialism refers to the intergroup domination in a culturally heterogeneous society. Tony Smith, in his work, The Pattern of Imperialism, points out that colonialism has to do with the domination by a strong state over a weak people and it does not control the same way as home population. By this general definition and assumption, colonialism began sometime around 1500 and lasted until about 1950 when most but not all of the colonial territories were granted or gained political independence. Colonialism was broadly exercised in two different forms in the world. Either it took place in the form of settlement or it created mere dependence. These two forms were experienced by the colonized in three different forms, namely extermination, assimilation and relative equilibrium. So what do we mean by extermination? In some cases, the dominant relationship between colonizer and colonized has led to the extermination of the later. History provides us with relatively few examples where total extermination of inhabitants of geographic entities occurred, such as European occupation of Tasmania and of some of the Caribbean islands. Even the example of United States where the settlement of vast continent meant the practical extermination of the natives. What is assimilation in colonialism? Then there are the cases of colonization where relationship between colonizer and the colonized led to the assimilation. In the process of assimilation, the colonizer acted as a donor and the colonized people constituted the host culture with a vast amount of cultural transfer going as the name implies from donor to host. Then we have relative equilibrium. Apart from two forms, the relationship between colonizer and colonized was also experienced in a way that neither extermination nor assimilation happened. Instead, settler and indigenes lived side by side or apart, but in either case, there was lack of eradication or assimilation. Among the former colonies that exemplified this type are Algeria, Rhodesia, Kenya, and South Africa. At this point, it's also important to differentiate between colonialism and imperialism, which are often used synonymously. Imperialism is a practice of extending the power, control, or rule by a country over economic or political life of areas outside its boundary. It's a control or influence that's exercised formally or informally, directly or indirectly, politically or economically. Colonialism, on the other hand, is a formal political control involving territorial annexation and loss of sovereignty. Now let's have a look on varied causes that led to the onslaught of modern colonialism in the world. Some of the important causes are 1. Industrial Revolution Industrial revolution is considered as one of the main reasons of the modern colonialism. 
It was industrial revolution that provided reason and funding for the wealthier nations for territorial expansion. With the establishment of new factories and industries, there was huge demand of cheap raw material, cheap labor and markets to sell the finished products. Even Lenin's theory on colonialism emphasized that colonialism was the product of late and overcapitalized capitalism seeking new outlets. Though it explained the expansion of capitalist nations in other lands in search of new raw materials and cheap labor, but there was also an expansion of non-capitalist states such as then Soviet Union and China in other lands. Number second, mercantilism. Another reason for separate of colonialism in the world is said to be mercantilism, which is defined as the economic practice in which European states use their economies to augment state power at the expense of other countries. It worked on the assumption that nation's wealth is increased by increasing the exports and increasing the trade. It was in favor of strict restrictions or protectionism. So it was believed by powerful European nations that economic development of mother country, that's metropoles, was important and it's the colonies which will serve to keep this agenda alive. Number third, rivalry among European powers. First, it was only Portugal and Spain which started territorial expansion and annexation of foreign lands. However, the same period it was witnessed that France and England too joined this race of reaching to foreign lands in search of raw materials and markets. So the acquiring of new colonies became a symbol of pride for these powers which in turn led to competitive colonization. Development of technology. Development in transport and communication is also regarded as one of the reasons that made colonialism possible. Navigation through sea routes with new technology like compass, innovation of steam engine and infrastructure to build up roads also made the process of colonization easily possible. These developments in technology gave advantage to these colonial powers in comparison to the colonized lands. As the focus of our course is South Asia, let's have a look how it started here. The political map of world changed dramatically between 17th and 19th centuries with the onslaught of colonization by European powers of distant lands in the East. Trade became one of the major instruments that linked the continents together and set off a European scramble to discover new resources and markets. Before the formal political control of colonial states, it was the private trading companies which reached across the world and their governments followed after them, inaugurating the modern era of colonialism. For the British, this role was carried by East India Company that linked Eastern and Western worlds. It was the East India Company which reached to the shores of South Asia and laid the seeds of colonialism. So let's have a look at a brief history of East India Company. It was during 16th century that English merchants became increasingly interested in possibility of capturing the spice trade in Indian Ocean, which Dutch and Portuguese companies were finding very profitable. With the grant of the Royal Charter from Queen Elizabeth I, the East India Company received the monopoly on all trade east of Cape of Good Hope for about 15 years. Though East India Company acted as private joint stock company, but it was granted a special provision of limited liability by the Crown. Although the British government neither held ownership of shares nor directed the activities of the company. The East India Company 
was created and expanded in a mercantilist era in which the conventional wisdom was that foreign trade monopolies were an effective vehicle for building the wealth and power of state. Indeed, the import into England and re-export to Europe of spices and other goods such as cotton and silk from the East was lucrative business in the 17th century. Spices like pepper, claw, mace, cinnamon and ginger were used to improve the taste of food or for making medicines and had huge market in Europe. One of the challenges that East India Company faced was what good to trade for the spices and other goods obtained as the woolen products of England had limited appeal among the merchants from the East. As the company increased its presence in India and other parts of Asia, it was able to use other products such as cotton, silk, sceptre used for manufacture of gunpowder and opium as a means of obtaining spices and other goods exported to England. The most dramatic change in the company's fortunes during 18th century occurred in the Indian subcontinent. In the various domains and principalities, the company operated by the permission of the rulers, but had to compete with other similar trading companies, in particular, in the 18th century, the French East India Company, which was also operated with its own armed forces and sought to ally with different Indian rulers or to win over rulers favoring British East India Company. The 18th century was also a period of political instability in Indian subcontinent as the great Mughal Empire disintegrated resulting in competition by aspirants as well as attempts by competing rulers to expand their states. The British and the French companies used their armed forces to protect and advance their interests which allowed them to become tipping factors in disputes between Indian rulers. The British East India Company eventually emerged victorious from the various armed conflicts. After defeating the Nawab of Bengal in the Battle of Plassey in 1757, it started its political campaign. According to Amritya Sen, what was seen after the Battle of Plassey is the financial bleeding of Bengal as the East India Company controlled Nawabs made Bing Bunny not only from territorial revenues but also from unique privilege of duty free trade in the rich Bengal economy and extraction of gifts from the local merchants. The profits made by East India Company from its economic operations in Bengal financed to a great extent the wars that the British waged across India in a period of their colonial expansion. It became the ruler of Bengal in 1757 and with further expansion by the end of 18th century, it was in effect a shadow of British Empire. In order to understand the nature of colonization in South Asia, it is important to engage with the colonial historiography and contestation it faced in later years. The term colonial historiography has been used in two senses. One relates to the history of colonial countries, while other refers to the works which were influenced by colonial ideology of domination. In fact, the practice of writing about colonial countries by the colonial officials was related to the desire for domination and justification for the colonial rule. The colonial historiography of the subcontinent was dominated by the historians and British officials who made attempt to justify the empire. Some of these earlier writers were categorized under the evangelical school, which emphasized that it was the divine right of the British rulers to bring the light of Christianity to this part of the continent and liberate people from the dark 
primitive religions and superstitions. The work of Charles Grant, Observation on the State of Society among Asiatic Subjects of India, was one such attempt to justify the colonial expansion of British. After the victory of Britain over Napoleon and France by 1815 and its shift to industrial mode of economy, this orientalist belief of superiority over other lands and races was enhanced and reflected by many historians. James Mill's work entitled History of British India was one such attempt. Belonging to the utilitarian school of thought, Mill was trying to portray the utilitarian agenda of British administration in the subcontinent. Dear students, it's interesting to note Mill had never been to India and his work was based on the works of earlier English writers and British officers who stayed in subcontinent for a brief period. Apart from these works, which contain the prejudice against the natives and justification of the British rule, there were also histories written which led to periodization of the history into ancient and medieval periods corresponding to Hindu and Muslim periods respectively. The work of Mount Start Elphinstone on the history of Hindu and Mohammedan India established this approach of periodization of Indian historiography in the two periods and it was his work which was later taught in the universities established in the British India. There were also contributions made by civil servants who were stationed in the subcontinent for longer period of time. Not only they repeated the prejudice against the natives, but also pointed out the fragility of the unity of Indian continent as one political unit and dangers of the outbreak of chaos in the absence of strong imperial authority. A long-serving British civil servant, Vincent Smith, argued in his book on the history of India that decline experienced by earlier empires in ancient and medieval times suggest there is a need of iron hand of imperial bridge which will bring stability in the region. In contrast to this historiography which was shaped by orientalist ideology of considering the races, religions and political systems of East outdated and primordial, there were also some works from the British writers which showed their sympathetic approach towards the natives. Edward Thompson, a missionary who taught for many years in Bengal, and G.D. Garrett, a civil servant in India, did not toe the line of earlier writers. Rather, they focused on rich culture, traditions that exist even prior to the British arrival in subcontinent. More such liberal works towards the later part of 19th century indicate that historiography witnessed an evolution from Eurocentric to that of more liberal approach towards subcontinent. Though it will be methodologically incorrect to homogenize colonial historiography as discussed above under one heading as there were different arguments and different approaches used by these British historians. But there are certain characteristics which represent the larger ideology and basis for such historiography, such as Orientalism. There is a strong Orientalist perspective in most of these works, which promote the superiority of modern Western civilization and categorize the East as primordial and outdated, which is in need of help from the West. Edward Said, in his path-breaking work on Orientalism, has brought this ideological bias in the colonial historiography into prominence. Many late 19th century British historians adopted social Darwinist notions about India. This implied that if a history is a struggle between various people and cultures akin to struggle among 
the species, Britain having come to the top could be ipso facto legitimately considered to be superior and as fittest to rule. Second, divided polity. One of the claims of British colonialism of subcontinent is that it is under the colonization that fragmented kingdoms and diverse regimes of the subcontinent were wielded into a nation. It was argued that there was no united political unit in the subcontinent and it was previously not one country at all but a thoroughly divided landmass. Third, stagnant society. In the opinion of many colonial historians, the society in South Asia was stagnant society, arrested at the stage of development. It followed that British rule would show the path of progress to a higher level. Hence, the idea that India needed Pax Britannica, the basic idea embedded in the tradition of colonial historiography was a paradigm of a backward society's progression towards the path of modern European civil and political society under the tutelage of imperial power. In short, the earlier British scholarship now identified as the earlier imperial historiography studied the lives of British statesmen, western institutions and ideologies and credited the British with making India into a nation. Colonial historiography was challenged at the beginning by the Cambridge School. The Cambridge School analyzed imperialism as a weak force in the 20th century, arguing that Indian collaboration was necessitated, thus allowing for the emergence of self-seeking, highly interested local factions and provisional elite groups who finally bargained effectively with the British for power and patronage. Indian nationalism in this version was explained as selfish rather than a heroic venture, turning the sacrifices of several generations of Indians into a base sentiment. Then came the nationalist historiography, which reversed the metropolitan perspective. Scholars belonging to nationalist historiographical tradition studied the lives of great Indian nationalists and the movements they led and argued that it was an idealist venture driven by indigenous forces of nationalist consciousness. This school of thought also criticized various claims of the British Empire. One of the claims of British colonialism of subcontinent is that it's under the colonization that fragmented kingdoms and diverse regimes of subcontinent were wielded into a nation. It was argued that there was no united political unit in the subcontinent and it was previously not one country at all, but a thoroughly divided landmass. But how far is it true? Although it's true that when East India Company defeated Nawab of Bengal, there was no single power ruling all over India. But the history is witness to the fact that the larger domestic empire existed throughout millennia before the arrival of the British. The United Empires under Ashoka, Gupta emperors, Alauddin Khilji and Mughals held the large empire which was later altered into cluster of fragmented kingdoms. Over the years, the nationalist school itself has been criticized by the subaltern school as being equally elitist because instead of turning lens on viceroys and governors, these historians glorified actions of key Indian leaders such as Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. In an electrifying statement issued in 1982, the founding member of Subaltern School, Ranajit Goha, alleged that the writing of Indian history had been marked by an elitist bias. 
Dear students, the British colonization had an impact on local industries, agriculture, politics and social relations. The contesting debates on historiography provides an intellectual and fertile ground to look critically into the impact of British Empire on the various sections of population in South Asia, which will be discussed in the next lecture. Dear students, with this, we are signing off our today's lecture. Hope you have enjoyed it. Thanks for watching it.